We'd like to thank the Stanley and Rumbo Jr. Legacy Society for sponsoring this forum. I'm Tim Malloy with the Civic Association and Palm Beach TV. Year after year, true to our mission, the Palm Beach Civic Association hosts forums, Q&A sessions, to try to educate our viewers and our local folks on issues that are here and affect us. Well, our neighbor across the water is the Port of Palm Beach. Pretty controversial, really interesting, a busy place. But a lot of people have opinions on it. And now there are people running for Port Commission. The port is an important force in our community. Today, a forum with some of the candidates who are running to be port commissioners. It's a big job. Port of Palm Beach has a lot of moving parts. Our moderator is a very familiar face, a trusted journalist, a friend of mine. Jim Sackett was the top anchor man in the market for three decades, and he picks up the forum from there. Hi, Jim. Well, thank you very much, Tim Malloy, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this candidates forum featuring the candidates for the Port of Palm Beach. Again, this forum is being sponsored by the Palm Beach Civic Association. There are two contested seats for the August 18th primary, groups two and uh, three. Wayne Richards is running in group one, but will not be on the primary ballot, but will be in November. And we offered Mr. Richards some time in this forum, uh, but he declined. So before we begin a quick outline of the format, had it, of course, not been for the virus, we would be doing this forum face to face. But using Zoom technology today, the candidates are together for this forum, but not all of them. Now, I hope, as Phil mentioned a little bit earlier, you'll be able to see the countdown clock. It will start when you begin your answers at 45. Uh, goes yellow at 45 then red at 15 and stays red all the way until the end. Now, if you start to go over a little bit, uh, then I'll have to jump in and say time out, you know, your time is up. Now, at a point in the proceedings, following the formal questioning of the candidates, we're going to allow the candidates in the contested groups to ask each other a question. And at the conclusion, the contested candidates in groups two and three will be who will be on the primary ballot will have up to two minutes for any closing statements. So now to the candidates running in the group two primary are Peyton MacArthur and Catherine Waldron. And we will now begin the forum with opening statements, starting with the candidates from group two. First, Peyton MacArthur. Mr. MacArthur, you have up to three minutes for an opening statement. Okay. First off, I'd like to Thank the Civic Association for sponsoring this. This has been an odd campaign year with the virus and Zoom. Uh, two months ago, I had never heard of Zoom. Uh, my name is Peyton MacArthur. I um, graduated from the University of Florida with honors and got a master's in public administration from the University of Florida. I um, have been an activist all my life. I was on the State Board of Common Cause and on the National Board of Americans for Democratic Action. ADA was the organization founded by Eleanor Roosevelt and Hubert Humphrey that introduced the first civil rights platform into the Democratic National Committee. Um, I uh, was in Washington for seven years, had a wonderful time in Washington, but uh, President Reagan and I didn't agree, so I left. Um, more recently, I was, I'm the only candidate who has actually worked at the Port of Palm Beach. I was Director of Human Resources and Labor Relations for seven years. I was actually Director of Human Resources when we hired the current Executive Director, Manuel Almera. He's the only Hispanic Executive Director in the uh, United States, so we're very proud of that. With the Port of Palm Beach, um, there are only 59 employees that work for the port. Everyone else works for our tenants. Um, I know each and every one of those employees. I know them well. I know their strengths. I know their weaknesses. I know their job descriptions and I know the expectations. I'm the only one with that kind of experience. I, um, to my knowledge, I'm the only candidate that has supported putting the Port of Palm Beach under an internal or external inspector general. And I am committed to the port. I will not resign to seek another race. 
I am not interested in any other races of any kind. I would like to see the um, court modernize its charter with the citizens um, council to make recommendations. There's so much we can do. The, the court is a wonderful organization. It's been very profitable. It will continue to be profitable. And I look forward to being part of that. And I ask for your vote on, on August 18th or before during early voting. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your comments. And now to Catherine Waldron. Ms. Waldron, you have up to three minutes for an opening statement. Okay, thank you. I too want to thank you. Uh, thank you to the Palm Beach Civic Association and Jim for taking your time out today to do this. Uh, my name is Catherine Waldron. I'm running for re-election in Group 2. Uh, a little bit about my background. I was born and raised in, Washington, in the Washington, D.C. area. I have a BA from the University of Virginia and an MBA from Palm Beach Atlantic University. <clears throat> I have uh, three adult children. My daughter lives in Connecticut. And my two sons live in the D.C. area. Uh, I've been in the business world my entire adult life. I think that's important because the, uh, the port is an economic driver for our community. Uh, my platform is basically, I wanna bring my business experience to the dais. I wanna make sure that we're supporting our tenants uh, in the best way we can right now, especially during this pandemic when uh, our tenants are being negatively impact, impacted um, in various ways. Uh, also, and, and one of the reasons I originally ran four years ago is to protect our environment. The channel, our shipping channel is right next to uh, some of the world's best snorkeling. Uh, the tourists, our tourists come down here and we come down here for the water, for the swimming, the boating, the fishing. And uh, it's important that we make sure we protect that. So uh, I ran because I felt that we did not need to dredge any deeper since no tenants needed it and it uh, hurt the environment. That is uh, different from maintenance dredging, of course, which we, of course, need to continue to do to keep the channels open. But also, I'm running because I'm a community activist. I feel like the port is a jewel in our community, and uh, we've been able to uh, showcase in many ways, including uh, when a few years ago I co-founded Palm Beach County Cares with uh, Ambassador Bernstein to help the hurricane victims, and we were able to use the port warehouse and logistics to get uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of supplies over on the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, so I'm very excited about running again. I've got a, a very strong support group and uh, a lot of endorsements, including uh, Congresswoman Frankel, uh, County Commissioner Melissa McKinley, uh, the mayors from most of the uh, municipalities that are, are within the district and including the town of Palm Beach mayor, Mayor Coniglio, uh, and uh, the unions, the firefighters, the Human Rights Council, and many more. And uh, you can go on to my website, votekw.com, to see all my endorsements and some more about my uh, platform and why I'm running. But uh, I want to thank you again for the time. And again, Catherine Waldron, Group 2. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Waldron. We appreciate that. Now on to Group 3 candidates for the Port of Palm Beach. Clarence Williams III, Mr. Williams, your opening statement, you have up to three minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sackett, for this opportunity. And I wanna thank the Palm Beach Civic Association for hosting this. Uh, no greater commitment to community than to do and take on tasks such as this in the midst of a pandemic to keep voters educated. Um, my name is Clarence Williams, and I'm a candidate for the Port of Palm Beach Group 3. Uh, I have over 45 plus years of public service. Um, I started my public service career in the city of Cincinnati, where I completed 27 years as a senior law enforcement executive. I then practiced law for about eight years and did some consulting. It was my consulting duties that brought me to South Florida 20 years ago. Uh, as a result of those duties, I ended up being the police chief in the city of Riviera Beach for 16 years. Uh, since then, I've retired uh, from the city uh, of Riviera Beach uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago. And I've been 
fulfilling my commitment to public service. I sit on uh, three uh, major nonprofit boards that range in service from healthcare to athletics to education. And so we're proud of that opportunity. We're running because we understand and realize that port authorities were created to be economic engines for the region in which they were created. Our port authority is bounded on the south by Southern Boulevard. And if you can imagine a line from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to Lake Okeechobee. On the north, it's bounded by Donald Ross Road from the same ocean to the same lake. That is the entire port district. Our port district represents more than the footprint that you see in Riviera Beach and Northern West Palm Beach. And it was created to have an economic impact throughout that district. Uh, that's why we're running to have the port use its economic muscle. All those uh, revenues that it generates or the impacts of revenues that it generates for this entire county to transform that into an economic engine and benefit for all of the municipalities and surrounding waterfront communities within the port district. Uh, so we're excited about the opportunity to be here. We're excited about the opportunity to be able to elevate the conversation around what a port authority can do. I've seen it work and port authorities can become an integral part of the economic development for communities, our port should step up and start realizing that same benefit. Thank you. Mr. Williams, thank you very much for your comments. Now your opponent in group three is Jean Enright, but she has declined to participate in this forum today. So we're going to move on to Roderick Clark. Mr. Clark is, uh, is, not, is a candidate, but he won't be on the primary ballot, but will be on the November 3rd ballot and uh, we have offered Mr. Uh, Clark uh, three minutes to talk to the voters. Mr. Clark, you're up. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Um, thank you, Palm Beach Association, for putting this on. Uh, this is so important, especially during this COVID-19 um, epidemic that we find uh, alternate means of hearing what the candidates have to do or, or what they can perform. Um, I've spent 20 years in the United States Marine Corps. I've, I've dealt with 9-11. I've dealt with um, um, sending troops myself, um, orchestrating to go into Iraq and eradicate the enemies, you know, for lack of a better word, or make sure America was not a target again. So I believe at this time and a very serious time in our um, culture right now, you need a strong leader. You need a leader that is confident, but you know what? You need a leader who's not a political engineer as far as I'm not generated or based on political narrative. I am a citizen, an active citizen, a citizen that just want to see change happen. I don't believe you need a politician. I need, I think you need somebody with a conscious of the, um, the public that knows what the public needs. And I know what the port needs. I ran a port when I was in Okinawa, Japan. I was done at the chief um, orchestrator of the port, making sure that drudging happened, making sure it was secured, making sure that the economic engine of the port kept going. We have a great port here. We are very blessed to have a port in our backyard, a port that generates money. We have vendors coming in, cruise lines going in and out. We have a very viable source of income right here. But the problem is a lot of people are not aware of its existence. If I'm elected, I will definitely be pushing forward so that high schoolers, middle schoolers, engineers from local colleges and high schools are equipped, are aware of the port, are definitely um, made time to come and be a part of the port because there's so much resources there from coral reefs to the running of the port, the day-to-day -day running, to the secure of the port, to vendors coming in and out, to cruise lines. There's so much jobs that are available that the port is is can offer and is offered right now to the economy. So I would love to definitely invest more time, resources in that, make sure the port is such a viable resources that everybody knows about the port and everybody knows the importance of the port right here in our backyard. There's so much things that the port can offer, but we're limited as far as knowledge of what the port is doing. And that's what I would like to push so that we are well aware of what the port can do 
and push it to its max, especially now where the port is losing money because of COVID. You need a strong leader to get in there and drive the resources again and drive the wheel of economy and drive the resources to make sure the port is, is back on top as it should be, as far as the museum being open and being funded, as far as knowledge of the running of the port is being um, exposed to the young minds. You need someone- Okay, Mr. Needs. Clark, uh, your, your three Thank minutes you. are up. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. Now, Mr. Clark, understand you will not be participating uh, any further in this, uh, in this forum, but we appreciate your, your contributions, Mr. Clark, and thank you all for your opening statements. And now to the question round. The candidates on the primary ballot from groups two and three will be responding and we will stagger your responses. For example, the first question is gonna go to Mr. MacArthur who answers, then Ms. Waldron's answer, then Mr. Williams, the second question, We'll go to Ms. Waldron and we'll just keep on rotating that way. So let's begin. Mr. MacArthur, dredging the inlet would allow bigger ships to come into the port, meaning, of course, more dollars. What do you think about digging deeper channels and allowing for larger cargo ships and perhaps even bigger cruise ships? You have up to two minutes to respond. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any desire on the part of the port to dredge so that bigger ships or bigger cruise ships can come into the port. What's needed at the port is to address some of the safety issues. Um, at various times, personally, the port pilots, the cruise ship, Tropical, Stone Rock, and Sugar have all asked for dredging to address these issues. Tropical a few years ago lost an engine going out of the inlet because it got caught in one of those. What we need to do is instead of polarizing each other about dredging and whether we need it or not, we need to uh, convene a citizens forum with interested parties and engineers. Engineers have assured me, engineers that I respect have assured me that the necessary safety dredging can be done without environmental disaster, without all the uh, alarms that I hear. We need to bring people together to see if we can resolve this together. I think we can. I don't think it's an either or. I think we can do both. The, um, the port is under a depth um, restriction now. That happens all too frequently. The issue is how are we going to provide for our current tenants, not future tenants, not bigger ships, our current tenants. And I think that's our responsibility. And as a port commissioner, you ought to put the port first. If you want to be an environmentalist, you should have joined the Audubon Society. The port commissioner has a fundamental responsibility to do what's in the best interest of the port. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Waldron, same question, up to two minutes. Thank you. Um, I, as everybody knows, I'm adamantly opposed to deep dredge for many reasons. One is that all the tenants have publicly said that they don't need it. The maintenance dredging is the key. And if we can stay on top of the maintenance dredging, then it, it will be safe and the, the tenants will have a safe passage in and out. Uh, there is the um, sand trans for a unit, transit unit that's on the northern part of the inlet that's uh, been out of commission, that has, has caused problems too. But it's a maintenance issue, it's not a deep dredging issue. Um, and furthermore, uh, to the point of, you know, we should just be focused on the port as a business, that is, you know, we're urban port and we're surrounded by municipalities. And the tourist industry uh, is the number one industry in our community. So we have to be cogniz cognizant of that. And we have to be able to work with our, our neighbors. Um, and if it's not needed, uh, then we shouldn't do it. It would be devastating from an environmental perspective to say that you can go drill several feet into coral and not have it negatively impact the environment is, uh, is just ridiculous. And uh, you know, not just the, but it's not just the environment. It's also the fact that we've got the tourist industry, we have the 
we have to worry about, and our neighbors who enjoy the water too. So when the tenants aren't needing it, and uh, when it's really more of a maintenance issue, that's what we need to focus on, maintenance, and making sure that the channels stay clear. Thanks. Mr. Waldron, thank you. Uh, Mr. Williams, same question, two minutes. For me, I have not heard, and nor has the case been made, uh, that would cause me as a policymaker to make a decision to uh, deepen and dredge further uh, in the inlet uh, beyond what is currently being done in terms of maintenance dredging. <clears throat> the problem with our inlet is one that uh, is of nature's making. First of all, it is not a natural salt chuck. It is a man-made salt chuck. And it's a man-made salt chuck that is closest to the Gulf Stream uh, as any place else on the continental shelf is. So as the Gulf Stream flows and its waters branch off and into our salt chuck and flow about to the base of the Blue Heron Bridge where they meet fresh water and the two can't combine, it's why we have near Sailfish Marina and the base of the Blue Heron Bridge some of the best uh, uh, snorkeling and diving that you'll find and they come from all over the world. And it is that reason that we are now doing and find ourselves doing the maintenance dredging. So if we dig deeper, do further dredging, we're still gonna have to be doing maintenance dredging. Uh, the case has not been made for me where the economic impacts of that is going to benefit the port, what the uh, environmental impacts would be, what the aesthetics impacts would be, all of those things I would have to see and hear as a policymaker uh, before I make a decision. And of course, you bring everybody that has a stake in the effort to the table for the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Now to the ne next question. Ms. Waldron, you will answer first. There are those who point the finger of polluting blame at the cruise ship industry. In today's pandemic environment, what should the future of the cruise industry be locally going forward? And you have up to two minutes. Well, I think uh, we have a lot to be uh, proud of with the cruise ship because the CDC put together a very ar uh, uh, arduous uh, program that all the cruise ships in the country had to go through to be get it, to get the green light in terms of what their uh, Corona uh, COVID-19 uh, program was. And we were the first, and I think as of today, still the only cruise ship the Bahamas Paradise Cruise Line was the only is the only cruise line that's gotten that. Um, so there's been no uh, no illnesses uh, on our on on the Bahamas Paradise Cruise Line as of said today as well. Um, in terms of the pollution, uh, I'm not sure if you're talking about there, there were a couple of things. There was there was medical waste that I understand that was coming up on the shore of uh, Palm Beach and we've, discussed, we've determined that that is not coming from our cruise ship. It's probably coming from the currents through, up through, uh, from Haiti. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they run a pretty clean, uh, clean, clean cruise ship. So uh, I feel like they are pretty good stewards for the environment. And, uh, and uh, but if there's an issue, I think we need to uh, obviously address it nothing formal has come has come to us at this point. Thank you. Mr. Will, uh, Mr. Uh, Williams, two minutes. In your role as a commissioner, I mean, you're sitting as the policymaker. You're sitting as the policy board, uh, creating policy uh, standards of operation for the business. And in doing that, you must take into consideration, you know, all the stakeholders who are involved in the decisions that you were going to be making around the cruise and what the cruise industry does. You know, of course, you, you want to rely on all local, state, and federal regulatory agent, agencies as you make policy around your business persons who are doing business with you and or tenants. So in, br in bringing all of those persons to the table, 
uh, insisting that there be complete compliance with existing state and federal laws and following those. And as a policymaker and a board, making certain that your staff, those persons whom you have, those professionals whom you have put in place to be responsible for the day-to-day -day operations are doing just that and working with our partners. Uh, we value at the port, the cruise industry, they're a substantial portion of the revenue that is generated there. And so we would want to try to do all that we can to make certain that they're operating safely, that their operations do not have an adverse impact on any of our surrounding neighbors and that we're all getting along. We're insisting that everyone be a good corporate citizen. And if we do that, then we can thrive. And uh, I, I think that those efforts, once, once we consider them, uh, we will be able to coexist in harmony uh, with the cruise industry. Mr. Williams, thank you. Mr. MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it has been a problem. It, it, unfortunately, it had an, a rare but occasional problem at the Port of Palm Beach. I think we need to work with the Florida Ports Council it's mostly federal regulations, but we need to see what we can do in addition to that. We need to work with the Florida Ports Council to um, what I'd like to see it to do is in the contracts with all of our vendors that bring in ships, and those are all of them, that we should have a provision that should there be waste dumped from that ship that we can verify was from that ship, there should be a substantial fine. And I think the only way to um, make sure it doesn't happen is to provide an economic incentive in the form of an economic penalty for people that violate the existing federal rules or other. And we should work with the Florida Ports Council and the National Association to urge federal authorities to strengthen those restrictions and also to help us identify the perpetrators. I don't think it's a problem that's going to go away until we make it an economic incentive. And I think we can do that by adding that provision in our contracts with not just the cruise ships, but with all the uh, vendors doing business at the Port of Palm Beach. As Catherine said, we're in an urban area. We have to protect not only the port, but the area around us. And I think we can do it. And we should. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. MacArthur. Mr. Williams, you'll respond to this next question first. What do you envision as the future of Peanut Island? Two minutes. Thank you so very much. I, I see Peanut Island being a valuable part of the uh, outdoor amusement uh, activities that we experience here in South Florida. Uh, I see us uh, partnering with the necessary private and public entities to make certain that we create a destination area that is going to be conducive and useful to everyone in the community and surrounding areas. Um, it is a valuable piece of uh, of real estate in terms of its attractiveness. And I would think that we would want to maintain uh, it in pristine uh, condition and encourage uh, its, its use uh, for boaters and swimmers and tourists uh, in the area. Is that it? Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. MacArthur, your response. Thank you. Um, Peanut Island is a jewel. Um, the uh, Kennedy Bunker is a national um, resource. I think the, um, unfortunately, I don't think the port is the entity to administer and protect Peanut Island. I think it needs to be done with a, a group. I would like to see us enter an interlocal agreement with the uh, Palm Beach County and the city of Riviera Beach. I think the city of Riviera Beach has the most direct interest in Peanut Island, but I think um, we should have a common vision. We should look together. 
I would, um, the town of Palm Beach is concerned about noise if there were certain events on the island. We need to restrict that. We need to, again, we need to come together as a group to see what is feasible, what we can do to accommodate the needs and the, address the fears of all the participants. The, um, but I think uh, River Beach really has to take the lead. I don't think the port has the financial resources, the staff to administer um, Peanut Island correctly. But um, I think we can do more, but we got to work with our partners. We have to work with the county and the cities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Walter. Yeah, uh, so we own six acres of the 60 acres uh, in Peanut Island. The rest is owned by, uh, you know, the county and uh, the Florida uh, Inland Navigational District. And um, we have historically uh, outsourced the management of it. Uh, prior to my coming on board four years ago, the, the entity that was managing it was didn't seem to be doing uh, a good job. So now we're, we've shut it down and we're faced with three to five million dollars of renovations to bring it back up to code. Um, so that's the current situation. We had been talking to the county uh, and uh, now we're talking to Riviera Beach. Uh, I do agree with my opponent that, uh, you know, we are not in the business of managing we, we shouldn't be in the business of managing that, but I would not want to get, we, we should not get rid of it. We should hold on to it and outsource the management. We just need to, to man, get the right entity to do it, whether that's Riviera Beach or the county, as long as when they do get it, they do a good job. I don't believe that it should become sort of an entertainment center. It's a historical place, a place where tourists could come to see the Kennedy Bunker, where we could have school children uh, visit. And I think that's very worthwhile. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm, I know that the current zoning doesn't really provide for uh, parties and weddings and things like that. And I don't think uh, that's a road that I personally don't want to go down. I think we just want to keep it the way it is, have a management entity come in and whether that's Riviera or the county, I just want whoever does it to do a good job. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. MacArthur, this will be for you to answer first. What are your thoughts concerning any commercialization of the port, transforming the way the port looks and functions? Two minutes. Commercialization of the port. I'm not sure exactly what you mean. We, we um, right now, the port is commercialized than the port is. Our vendors employ about 3,000 people in good paying jobs. The port is a landlord port. We um, rent basically to our tenants who do the work. We, um, our current executive director, Manuel Almera, has done an excellent job of utilizing every nook and cranny at the port to facilitate uh, commerce, to facilitate the needs of our our tenants. I um, honestly don't think we can do much more other than the issue is, can the port expand? Can the port acquire land to, a, um, to facilitate additional commercialization? We probably can, but that's a, um, we have um, had an interlocal agreement with the city of Rivera Beach. We need to, um, pursue that with the city of Rivera Beach. We need to be a good neighbor. I think, um, actually, I think the port's done a very good job with its limited resources at maintaining a vibrant commercial um, enterprise. I think um, we should all be very proud of it. It is an economic engine. 3,000 good paying jobs and the future looks bright. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waldron. Uh, yeah, so um, if you're talking about expanding and in, uh, in terms of commercialization, as as my opponent said, we're you know we're landlocked, we're 162 acres, so we're a niche port. We're small compared to Port of Miami, Port Everglades, very small. Um, but we're also very successful. In fact, I think a few years ago we were the most efficient port in the country. So we do a lot with a, with a little. But 
we I am all in favor of expanding uh, our opportunities, and that's why um, one of the things I'm interested in continuing to pursue, although it's it's uh, it's not an easy thing, is is an inland port, which is really an inland port like a d distribution center. While our port doesn't necessarily need it, we can act as a catalyst for the port Port Everglades and Port of Miami to help with their distribution. And that would also pull traffic off of uh, our interstates further west, which would decrease congestion and increase safety. And it would provide jobs, uh, much needed good paying jobs out in the glades. So I think exploring something like that, uh, you know, it's been several years, it's been talked about for many years and the timing has never been, has never been right for a lot of different reasons. And I feel that, uh, you know, with the right commissioners uh, up there, I think we could get a lot of support and really pursue it. Because I can tell you that um, all three mayors out in the Glades, Pahokee, South Bay, and Bell Glade have all endorsed me. And a lot of that is because I'm a big proponent of invested, continuing to push for an inland port. So thanks. Thank you. Mr. Williams? As I said during my introduction, you know, the, the the port district, the Port Authority district is vast. It represents over 50% of the land mass of this county. And as long as our business model philosophy is to simply uh, grow our revenues from the existing footprint that we now know at the, at the port, we're going to t continue to be conflicted on what is there and its impact on surrounding communities. No, we have to take advantage of the vastness of the Port Authority District to look at our economic expansion capabilities to include uh, inland ports on the western part of the district. Opportunity zones are, have been created and opportunity zones exist in all three of those communities in the Western community. The port using its economic muscle and leverage can create the proper public private partnerships to take advantage of those opportunity zones to increase uh, economic development, growth and development there uh, to build warehouses, to build truck depots, manufacturing and logistics centers all of those things created in the design to kind of take pressure off of that footprint that we see right there in Riviera Beach and Northern West Palm Beach. And the more we try to cram into that space, the greater the conflict is going to be with those who have uh, adjoining other uses. So we have a heavy industry in close proximity to residential settings and we have to be able to be creative to expand that so that the burden is not adversely affecting uh, surrounding communities. Thank you, sir. And thank you all for your uh, answers to our questions. And we have one last task that we uh, informed you about. Each candidate will ask your primary opponent a short, short question. So you will have up to two minutes to answer. We'll begin with group two, Mr. MacArthur, your question, if you will, to Ms. Waldron. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, the inland port keeps coming up. I'd like to know there are three impediments to the inland port. The port doesn't own any land. It would cost 250 million to extend the railroad and the port doesn't have imports. We're an export port. In the last three years, you uh, brought that up, at, I think your first meeting, what have you done to address those three impediments to an inland port? Go ahead, Ms. Waldron. Uh, okay, so basically uh, when I was meeting with the county and the Business Development Board and Florida Crystals and the uh, uh, Glades uh, elected officials uh, several years ago, there was land. Florida Crystals has land, and then there was the 80 acres next to uh, Florida Crystals. Uh, it was right off Route 27 that, uh, if you recall, the legislature had said to South Bay is that we will um, give you that land for you to use uh, for to start up a proof of concept uh, in coordination with Florida Crystals. 
um, and we will forgive you uh, a loan. So we met with uh, all the interested parties. Everybody was interested. The uh, hiccup occurred because of the contractual terms between South Bay and Florida Crystals, which was basically uh, the terms that Florida Crystals didn't like was the uh, amount of time they were going to have to, uh, to build it. But we weren't starting with, we actually do, did have land. Florida Crystals uh, was engaged. Uh, the Business Development Board was committing resources, as was the county. Um, uh, county Commissioner Melissa McKinley had actually dedicated a portion to this effort. And it was going to be a small proof of concept on that 80 acres. And assuming that that uh, went well, showing the distribution center could be uh, successful, then Florida Crystals would expand it into their several, several hundred acres, which is right uh, adjoining it. So uh, that's the status. Um, I think uh, from my conversations with the mayors, um, revisiting it now in the coming year is a good time because of some of the FEMA things that have been worked out and uh, the dam issues. And those, those were a couple of the hiccups. So um, I think it's a good time to re revisit it because the interest is definitely there. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Waldron. Now, uh, your question to Mr. MacArthur. Um, my question is, uh, four years ago, you voted against the deep dredge. Uh, it was unanimous. Uh, and what has changed in terms of your position? Because What has changed is I talked to more engineers, and I said at our previous meetings, one of the most knowledgeable engineers on the um, the port in the port area is a retired engineer by the name of G Gerald Ward. I've met with him many times and he has assured me that it can be done with a minimum of um, adverse effects. I think the, the way to do it, as I said earlier in my presentation, I think what we need to do is to bring all the interested parties together. Nobody wants to do dredging that would destroy the best snorkeling area in the probably in the United States. Nobody wants to do that, but I think we can have both, and we need to do that by bringing people together. Rather than the people in Palm Beach just saying no, we're against anything at the port, and the port saying we have to have deep dredging, I think there is a compromise where we can all come together. If it's true what Gerald Ward has told me, that we can, it can be done with um, sufficient oversight to ensure that there aren't adverse effects, I think that we, uh, it's something that we can um, achieve. I, um, I'm always open to new things. I want the port to be viable economically, and I believe this is the way to make sure the port is viable economically this year and for years to come. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. MacArthur. Now, uh, we're going to move on to group three. However, the only candidate in group three that's going to be on the eight, uh, August 18th ballot is Mr. Williams. Ms. Enright is not here. So we've agreed that, uh, Mr. Williams, you have two minutes to talk about anything you want, since no one is there to ask you any questions. Well, again, thank you so very much. Yeah, our Port Authority was created, as I said, at the top of the hour uh, to be an economic engine for the entire district. And that district represents over 50% of the land mass of this county. Uh, our business model has to be one that we have to look be beyond simply the footprint that we now know as the Port of Palm Beach, if we're going to realize the true economic strength and muscle of the port. I'm a proponent of revitalizing and taking the lead on the discussions around an inland port. We have the privilege of being endorsed by all three mayors in that Western community. And we've talked with a number of other uh, environmental and uh, activist groups like LORE in the Western communities. And all of those communities believe that an inland port would be a tremendous economic boost to its community and it would create bottom line jobs. My whole focus and mission for taking on this is that I realize that underserved communities and communities of color will never realize their true potential until they become economically viable. And there are ways to get it done. 
what exists now that didn't exist uh, in terms of talking about the inland port are the opportunity zones that now all of those communities are in. Those opportunity zones give the ability for government and the private sector to partner together to do extraordinary things. Same way that same public-private partnership built three, two major ball diamonds here in our city. Uh, so we're excited about the opportunity. We've been endorsed by Blue Wave. We've been endorsed by North PAC and the Palm Beach Human Rights Council. Uh, looking for your support on August the 18th. I'm not a politician. Thank I'm you. A public thank you, sir. Thank you. We thank appreciate you very much. it. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Now to the closing statements. You'll have up to two minutes, and we're going to begin in reverse order from the opening statements, starting with group three. That means, Mr. Williams, you have another two minutes for a closing statement. Mr. Williams. Well, thank, thank you so very much, Mr. Sackett. And I, I will not take uh, uh, that full time. I will simply uh, say to the listeners and to the voters uh, that uh, we are working hard to elevate the conversation around this tremendous economic engine. I've seen it work in other communities. I've seen what port authorities can do when they put their economic weight behind efforts, when they create the proper public-private partnerships necessary, when they take advantage of existing opportunities that government now provides, like opportunity zones. Uh, doing and taking on these projects is not an easy task. It is a difficult and hard one. And we're put in place to make the difficult and hard decisions but not in an isolated bubble. We have to do it in conjunction with and evaluate its impacts on all communities that are served by what it is that we do. Uh, so we're looking forward to the opportunity to serve on the port alongside Ms. Waldron. Uh, and uh, we are of the opinion that the port and the port operations will be enhanced uh, once there. So thank you so very much for that. Um, we uh, wanna also suggest uh, that we've received the endorsement of the mayor of West Palm Beach in addition to those three mayors in the West. Uh, Commissioner Joe Paduzzi has endorsed us. Former mayor of Palm Beach Gardens, Eric Jablin has endorsed us. Uh, the Palm Beach County Human Rights Council has endorsed us. Blue Wave has endorsed us. Business in the North County has endorsed us, North PAC. And so we're excited, we've elevated the conversation. We're looking forward to serving, continuing to serve the residents of this great community. So thank you so very much and thank the Civic Association for this platform. Thank you very much. Ms. Waldron. Yes, uh, thanks again for hosting us. Um, you know, the port's over hundred years old and as the communities have grown up around us, uh, you know, obvious tensions uh, emerge because we're an urban port, and I think we have to be very cognizant of that. It's uh, it's not mutually exclusive to have a successful port and have good relations with our neighbors. Um, and I think that uh, more outreach and more communication between us and the municipalities is important. And that's one of the things I've tried to do uh, in my first term is do some more outreach and and, and things like that. Uh, the port is a jewel uh, for our community. We put it's, it's almost a uh, quarter million dollars, uh, a quarter billion dollars, two hundred fifty million dollars a year in economic impact to our county. So it's something that's very vital to us. And being able to, as Clarence, as uh, Clarence has said, uh, create an inland port um, and create more jobs uh, is is lifts all boats in, in my mind. Um, and so I just think that uh, continuing to focus on that and promote and help our tenants through the pandemic, which as we all know is in impacting all businesses um, and making sure that when the pandemic, uh, we come out of this pandemic, that they're as financially healthy, as healthy as possible, just paramount. So uh, my business background, which is, uh, I think I have the most depth of business experience of anybody on the commission, and any candidate, I think that is really helpful. Uh, I also think bringing in uh, new ideas and fresh perspective, uh, such as the, that from uh, uh, Mr. Williams, is important too. I think uh, we don't. What we don't want to have is have commissioners just 
kind of uh, phoning it in for uh, several decades. So I think that um, bringing in a, a new new ideas, new new people is is good. So uh, I'm looking forward to you know working with Commissioner uh, Mr. Williams. Thanks. Thank you very much, and Mr. Peyton MacArthur. Thank you. Again, I'd like to uh, thank the Civic Association for sponsoring this. I'd like to remind the listeners that I'm the only candidate that has worked at the port and been a commissioner. I have a unique background. I'm the only candidate who has mentioned putting the port under the inspector general. I am the only candidate that has been endorsed by two port commissioners, Commissioner Enright and Commissioner Anderson. Um, they work, they served with both Ms. Waldron and myself, and uh, they made the decision that they wanted to support me, and I appreciate that. I think there's a lot we can do. We need to bring people together and stop being so divisive. Uh, my opponents like to talk about endorsements, so I thought I'd um, make a little list this time. So I've been endorsed by Port Commissioner Jeannie and Wright. I've been endorsed by Port Commissioner Joe Anderson. And additionally, I've been endorsed by the following. Former County Commissioner Paulette Burdick, former County Commissioner Jess Santa Maria, former County Commissioner Addie Green, former County Commissioner and Port Commissioner Priscilla Taylor, Councilwoman Kashamba Miller Anderson, City Councilman Tradrick McCoy, City Commissioner Corey Nearing, Royal Palm Beach Mayor Fred Pinto, Edith Bush, the founder and CEO of the Martin Luther King Coordinating Committee. I think that's enough. I, well, I'll give you one. This is fun. Uh, if anybody that's familiar with Century Village, there is a, the president and the treasurer don't get along at all. They both have endorsed Peyton. <laughs> Thank you. That's all. Thank you, sir. And with that, that is the conclusion of this candidates forum. On behalf of the Palm Beach Association, I would like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank the candidates for participating today. And those of you who joined us on Zoom to see and hear the candidates. Once again, thank you very much for participating today. And a reminder, the primary is August 18th. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our thanks to Jim Sackett and of course all the candidates and a special thank you to the Stanley M. Rumbaugh Jr. Legacy Society. Uh, this will be available on pipecivic.org, this whole broadcast. If you'd like to re-look at it or you want to email it to somebody, it's worth a good second look. I'm Tim Malloy with the Civic Association and Palm Beach TV. We'll talk to you soon. We are grateful to today's sponsor, the Stanley M. Rumbo Jr. Legacy Society, and to the individuals who have made gifts and bequests to provide for educational programs in perpetuity.